the forum can think of no better person to institute the first annual Rappaport lecture than our guest, Mayor Koch. Now, to, inst to introduce you to our main guest, uh, we have Professor Lance Liebman of Harvard Law School. I was given the great honor of introducing Mayor Koch because once a very long time ago, I held a minor position on the staff of one of his predecessors, Mayor Lindsay. I could tell you at length about my mistakes, frustrations, and failures working in City Hall in New York, but Mayor Koch usually talks about his successes, so I will tell you that I had one success. One day during Lindsay's 1969 re-election campaign, I was in charge of a photo opportunity, a visit by the mayor to a new air-conditioned subway train. With the TV cameras running, the mayor went down into a station to see the new train. Many functionaries of the Transit Authority were uh, guiding the mayor, and they were holding open an exit gate so he could walk straight to the platform. In an unplanned moment of genius, it occurred to me to reach into my pocket, grab a token, give it to the mayor, and point him to the turnstile. All the local news shows that night made a point of showing that he had paid just like an average strap hanger. For 24 hours, I was a hero in City Hall. I was an amateur at politics of that sort. Mayor Koch has for 30 years been a professional. He has symbolized the citizen of New York City, in New York City and around the world. He has proved that while a mayor manages large bureaucracies, his main function is to speak to and on behalf of those who are his constituents. He is a brilliant urban leader, and his talents have been crucial in the survival and the resurrection of a wonderful and important city. Mr. Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor, for that very uh, generous introduction. I want to uh, say to uh, Mrs. Strapport and to members of the uh, faculty uh, how honored I am uh, that uh, you would uh, choose me as uh, your uh, first speaker. And uh, the subject that I've uh, taken is that uh, relating to uh, uh, juvenile uh, criminality. And I think it's a matter of extreme importance because I do not believe that we are addressing the issue appropriately. I want uh, to uh, make some formal uh, remarks on the subject and then to take your Q&A on any subject that you uh, believe uh, appropriate. But this uh, is a uh, matter of concern uh, not only uh, for uh, New York but for uh, every uh, urban and suburban and indeed even uh, rural uh, jurisdictions. Probably you've uh, all heard someone start a speech uh, about juvenile crime with a quote about young people being wild and disobedient and disrespectful, constantly breaking the law and violating social mores. And the source of the quote is invariably some ancient sage who is prophesying the imminent collapse of civilization. And the quote is supposed to show that in spite of thousands of years of those complaints, civilization hasn't com collapsed, and that adults always overreact to high-spirited adolescents, that our modern-day problem isn't really all that serious. Well, I don't believe in such attempts to sentimentalize the youthful, predatory, and violent behavior which is endemic in our society, and of a scope which uh, may be unprecedented for sheer impact upon public safety. You've probably heard that juvenile criminality is caused by poor parents, poor schools, poor housing, poor neighbors, poor race relations, and poorness in general. I don't believe that either. The vast majority of citizens who are poor or uneducated do not steal, do not assault, and do not destroy. They reject, as I do, this elitist and insulting explanation of the cause of crime. Western civilization may not be collapsing, but we must take seriously young people who are given to violence and to cruelty. And I'm not speaking about youngsters who chew gum in class or talk back to their elders. For the most part, juveniles engaged in felonious conduct don't grow out of it. Their disruptive behavior, disruptive juveniles grow into delinquent adolescents, and delinquent adolescents grow into criminal adults. That knowledge should be the basis of our juvenile criminal justice planning. 
and it's time to rethink our attitudes about juvenile criminals. We have to retool our procedures to deal with the problem effectively. We need better ways to accurately identify juvenile criminals as individuals and as a class. We need realistic crime and age uh, categories for juvenile uh, criminals, and we need the ability to effectively arrest, to detain, and prosecute, and punish juveniles. It's important to note that a relatively small number of people commit an overwhelming majority of all crimes in both the juvenile and adult populations. A recent study of criminal records in Philadelphia reveals the connection between chronic juvenile offenders and their evolution into adult career criminals. Of persons born in 1958 who lived in Philadelphia from 1968 to 1975, only 7% of the youths were identified as chronically delinquent, but they accounted for 75% of all serious crime in their age group. Let me repeat that. 7% of the youth accounted for 75% of the serious crime. The core 7% or so of the population which is actively and persistently criminal is a figure that is fairly universal and which has remained stable over so many years. But today, this core criminal fraction is committing more crime and more serious crime. The core criminal group is composed primarily of young males who are demonstrably and unusually aggressive and impulsive and who lack socialization. They also have lower than average intelligence. Now, criminals may be less capable than most uh, people of analyzing and understanding and recognizing what is right and what is right appropriate and non-criminal behavior. But and this is important, would-be criminals can learn what is appropriate. They can learn, but if and only if values and appropriate standards of behavior are clearly, consistently, and constantly taught, and only if deviations from appropriate behavior are clearly, consistently, and constantly punished. I think punishment does deter crime. And the more certain the punishment and the certainty of its imposition, the better it works. And I will tell you why. It works because most people prefer pleasant consequences to the unpleasant. And most of us have fairly standard conceptions of what is pleasant and what is unpleasant. Jail is not broadly perceived as a pleasant experience. And we can be certain that not punishing improper behavior has no deterrent effect. Paul Tracy, one of the authors of the Philadelphia study, makes the not so surprising, not so surprising to me statement that, I quote, if you let a kid do what he does with impunity, then he's going to continue to do it. I don't know why people think punishment doesn't work. It clearly does. In a sentencing report, a probation officer asked a 15-year-old why he stepped up the pace of a string of robberies when he turned 15. His answer was quite simple. It wasn't poverty. It wasn't lack of education. He had escalated the rate of his robbery activities because the crimes, as he put it, were free. He wouldn't be punished for committing crimes before he was 16, and he had to plan for his future. How much clearer a demonstration do we need that criminals, even juveniles, understand and are deterred by punishment or the threat of it? This young man was not unusually clever. The same sentiment that crime before 16 is free is frequently expressed by juvenile criminals. It doesn't take a lot of intelligence to figure that out. Why do so many intelligent people refuse to believe it? So, what do we need to better handle our juvenile crime problem? To help solve the problem, I'm supporting several proposals which are before the New York State Legislature this year. States which have similar problems might do well to consider similar solutions. To begin with, we have almost made it impossible to even identify juveniles charged with crimes, let alone connect them with other criminal conduct in which they 
may have engaged. Thanks to some well-intentioned but misguided efforts to avoid stigmatizing a young person for life with a police record, we don't fingerprint most juvenile criminals charged with felonies. But without fingerprints, we cannot definitely identify people, especially young people, or accurately determine their ages, an important part of our juvenile justice procedure. I'm not talking about identifying kids who set off firecrackers in the alley or put soap powder in a public fountain. Almost half of the juveniles arrested in New York City in 1985 were charged with Class D and Class E felonies, which are robberies, sodomies, and sexual abuse, and burglaries, and arsons, and assaults, and the possession of weapons. These crimes are not fingerprintable under current law. In 1984, some 2,100 serious juvenile felony cases were processed in this city in which we couldn't even confirm the identities of the juveniles involved. How can we expect a young person to respect a system where he's interviewed by a probation officer who recognizes him from the last time or the last three times or the last ten times that he was brought in but can't figure out what his real name is and who has no capacity to do so. How can we run a system uh, like that? I think we should fingerprint any person age 13 or older who is charged with any felony. Also, we should require the appropriate authorities to maintain any juvenile delinquent adjudication of any fingerprinted person and preserve for adult records any juvenile conviction record for a class A, B, or C felony or for any two felonies. Then we need to allow access to these records in proper circumstances, of course, to the family court probation officers and to the prosecutors and to defense counsel and to the judges. It doesn't come as a revelation to me that probation officers need to know whether and how a particular juvenile's prior cases have been disposed of. Only in this way are they to be able to make a disposition recommendation which will best serve the interests of the community and the delinquent. In recommending a disposition in a juvenile case, a probation officer should be able, and in New York State is required by our prior offender provisions to consider whether this is the first time or the tenth time that we've seen this person. We should consider what past programs or punishments have accomplished, if anything, uh, that certainly makes uh, just common sense, but probation officers now can't even look back into the probation's own files, let alone consult comprehensive files organized in an accessible fashion. Legislation plainly exempting internal agencies of the criminal justice system from general sealing requirements controlling juvenile records is imperative. Keeping usable records will, for the first time, make it possible to deal with juveniles on a consistent and progressive basis. Ridiculous as it seems, We've never tried knowledge and consistency as a way to improve our juvenile justice program. There is also no reason for juvenile delinquency proceedings to be conducted in secret. They should be open to the public and the press, which will serve the dual purposes of revealing inadequate family court procedures and dispositions and exposing the juvenile delinquent to public accountability for his actions. Accountability is one of the most basic elements of dealing with misconduct on any level. And after we establish a mechanism to identify our juvenile criminal population, we have to be able, when it is necessary and appropriate, to treat juveniles with charges and in age categories which reflect the seriousness of the conduct. We need to expand the categories of so-called designated felonies for which juveniles can be prosecuted to include, among other crimes, residential burglaries and all attempts to commit designated felonies. And we must also restrict family court judges' unfettered discretion, which they now have in even very serious felonies. And the law allows them to adjourn matters in contemplation of dismissal to, as we refer to it in New York, ACD, the case over the objection 
of the prosecutor. Juvenile criminal cases must be treated with appropriate seriousness at all levels of the system. In New York, juveniles who are adjudicated delinquents and sentenced to confinement in facilities of the State Division for Youth can be released as soon as they arrive without notice to anyone. The director can release them to their home. Public safety requires that prosecutors should have notice and should have an opportunity to be heard when dangerous juveniles are released before they have spent at least two-thirds of their placement time in a residential facility. All of these recommendations have a common thread. In an overwhelming percentage of cases, adults and juveniles commit crimes because the rewards of criminal conduct are sufficiently great and the likelihood of being caught or held responsible is sufficiently remote. Crime then becomes attractive. We don't have sufficient resources to catch and to punish all, or even most criminals. National law enforcement authorities agree that the great majority of serious crimes in this country go unpunished. We must punish the criminals when we are so fortunate as to catch them. Juvenile criminals are willful, selfish, and irresponsible individuals, and experience shows us they will grow up to be willful, selfish, and irresponsible adults unless we persuade them that there are real penalties for such conduct. And when we deter young people from committing juvenile crime, we have a chance of deterring them from adult crime, a chance of saving them from a lifetime of pain for themselves and their society. Just to conclude the formal remarks and then we'll go to Q&A. If you ask uh, people, what is it that they want out of life? It is to be secure in their homes, the streets that they walk, the subways that they ride. And it is knowing that there was a time when people did feel secure. And then there was this escalation. And all the time, the protection seemed not to be for society, but rather for the person charged with criminality. Now, there has to be a balancing of interests. It cannot be that our only concern is for the defendant and the person charged with criminality. Our overriding concern has to be for the protection of society. The balance is out of whack, and I believe must be restored. I'll stop. I'll take your questions. Who's got the first question? Sir. Mr. Mayor, I hope... Oh, I, uh, you have a mic there. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. I hope you'll forgive me if I ask a question on a different topic. No, I, we said it uh, from the very beginning. You can ask anything on anything. Okay. Uh, I want to ask you about the corruption scandal mm -hmm. uh, in New York. Uh, you've been introducing over the last few weeks a, an impressive list of reforms to uh, deal with the way that the city dishes out contracts and political appointments. And I have full faith that the investigators will gradually nail down all the individuals and figure out who was paying off whom and at whose direction. But I want to ask you, what, what is wrong in the system that allowed us to get to this point in a broader sense that such a widespread or apparently widespread scandal could develop under our very noses? Okay, it's a fair question. And let me just take a couple of minutes to uh, respond. As of this moment, one person has been arrested. Are you aware of that? I suspect that there will be more uh, people. And uh, we know that the uh, borough president of Queens has uh, stepped down. And there's no question in my mind that he's implicated uh, in that. And it will be the uh, criminal uh, court processes uh, that will uh, pursue uh, that uh, matter uh, with him. Now you have to uh, ask, uh, as you have, why is it that we didn't know about this particular item of corruption? That corruption exists in a city? You think it exists in uh, Philadelphia, Boston, LA, Chicago? Of course. Do you know that? In the, because you know why it exists? Because the people who work in a city government come from society. And Boston has less than 600,000 people living in the city, I'm told. 
there are 300,000 people working in the city government of New York. More than half the population of the city of Boston, the number, represents our employees. Now, obviously, they're going to be corrupt people. They come from a society that has corruption in it. Now, as it relates to the catching of this particular corruption, it was not caught in New York. It was caught on a telephone tape in Chicago, where law enforcement authorities had been given information about Chicago corruption in government, and listening to a tap conversation, heard about a corrupt act in New York, and gave the information to the law enforcement authorities in New York. Normally, when you find corruption, and we have arrested and sent to uh, jail or sought to send to jail, and sometimes judges uh, would simply give fines or weekends in jail, which is a fact. In some cases, it's regrettable, but a fact. Hundreds of people have been uh, sent to jail. This was not found. I'm sorry about uh, that. I hope uh, that uh, they uh, root it out and uh, find everyone involved uh, in it and they send them to jail. But why should it shock you that there would be corruption in any city in America, including New York City? Go ahead. Well, Mr. Mayor, we're not talking about the 300,000 city employee. We're not talking about a brownie who fixed his parking ticket. We're talking about what appears to be a widespread uh, system of corruption among the highest well, officials I, in the city that's government. That's why, I, well, no, you see, you have to be careful about that. One person has been arrested, is that right? One so far. That's right. Okay. I mean, this has been going on now for weeks. Is that right? We know one person has been arrested and one person has been identified as being involved, the borough president, and the involvement will have to be established through the criminal court uh, process. I am not defending it even if it's one. I am simply saying that there has never been a city or an administration that did not have within it people who were corrupt, not intentionally, whether it's my three immediate predecessors or the mayor of mayors, Fiorello LaGuardia. So I'm not defensive about it, but I accept responsibility and fault. I want you to understand that. Anything that takes place in the city of uh, New York that's good, I take credit for it if it happened uh, in my administration. And if it is bad, I accept blame. And then the question is, what do you do about it? Well, you do what's reasonable, what's common sense. And I'm going to use your question uh, to just extend this, because I think it's probably interesting to most people, because it's on the front pages. Uh, <laughs> right. You know, when uh, the matter uh, came to public attention as it related to the borough president, it was a shock to me. He's independently elected uh, by the people in Queens, highest office, a uh, friend of mine for uh, at least 20 years, maybe more. And it was a shock uh, to me. And I said it was horrible. And I gave vent to my anger, and I labeled him for what he is. Because it might offend the reporters. <laughs> I say uh, <laughs> for a moment that I believe that public officials are held to a higher standard than whether they've been indicted <laughs> or arrested. And so I hold my fellow public officials, as I do myself, to a higher standard. I was shocked, frankly, that there were people who attacked me for labeling Mr. Manis what he is someone who violated his public uh, oath of office and engaged in criminality. And I wondered why it was that they were so ferocious in their comments as they related to me and my comments. I don't really uh, know. Uh, some uh, undoubtedly uh, possessed uh, with this overbalancing of interest to somewhat along the lines of defending the criminal as opposed to society that I referred to in my speech. Others, I think, somewhat hypocritical. 
I, uh, this is not an attack on the press, uh, uh, not intended that way, but it's just interesting since this is a classroom. It's a classroom. Uh, a, a, uh, a reporter uh, said to me uh, on a television show, don't you realize the pain that you caused that family by your labeling uh, the husband, your friend, uh, with this uh, terrible word? I'll tell you the word at the end. <laughs> and I said to this reporter, I was trying to be kind. I wanted to say, did not, what kind of a hypocritical statement is this? Are you aware of all of the reporters who stand in front of his house, who stood in front of the hospital and badgered his kids and his wife and put mics in his uh, face when he went to the uh, doctor? And you're telling me that in my capacity as mayor of this city, I'm not allowed to label a crook a crook? I was aghast, but I said very little. <laughs> now, what is it uh, that we're seeking to do to root out corruption? I appointed uh, a former U.S. attorney, John Martin, to root it out, to tell us what practices have to be changed. We're cooperating with the U.S. attorney. The U.S. attorney and John Martin and the district attorney said to me, it would be helpful if you gave what is in effect civil immunity to people who come forward and say they were involved in the corruption if they help us to establish corruption on the part of others. And I said, it goes against my grain to give immunity to a corrupt person. But if you believe it's helpful to your investigation, we will do it. The civil aspect of allowing them to continue with their contracts, providing uh, that uh, they deliver a service without corruption. So I think that, of course I'm embarrassed. Of course I'm embarrassed. I mean, uh, it's horrible. Horrible. And I thought to myself uh, when uh, uh, the matter was uh, raised on a couple of occasions, I thought to myself, what's the public think? And uh, one of the newspapers, one of the uh, Daily, Daily News, great newspaper in the city of New York, uh, <laughs> that's the largest circulation in the, uh, maybe in the country, I don't know, in the country. So let's not uh, forget that. They uh, did a poll. <laughs> and they did a poll, and the poll results were quite interesting. The poll results uh, were the following. They said to them, what do you think of uh, politicians, public officials? And 42% said most of them are corrupt. What do you think of Ed Koch? 79% said he's honest. In Queens, 88%. I can't quite understand that. <laughs> 71% uh, said uh, the mayor is doing a good job. Two-thirds uh, said, in response to the question, well, if they show corruption in uh, the uh, Parking Violations Bureau, do you hold the mayor responsible? And they said, no. I hold myself responsible, even if they don't. Okay? Next. <laughs> Sorry. Mayor Koch, my question concerns the Guy MacGyver case. I was wondering, first, do you agree with uh, Governor Cuomo's decision to grant clemency? And second of all, how do you account for uh, Vice President Bush's comments recently at a conservative dinner when he said that, as Governor Ronald Reagan, didn't set cop killers free? Uh, I happen uh, uh, to believe uh, that uh, uh, the governor should not have uh, provided uh, for, uh, what's it, it uh, reduction in sentence. He did not uh, give him uh, a pardon, but a reduction in sentence uh, that would make him eligible at an earlier time uh, for a pardon. But that is a decision which is a very difficult one for uh, governors. They're given the power to pardon. They're given the power to commute. They're given the power to reduce sentences. And it's a tough decision. I can disagree 
with the governor without finding him at fault. You, you can understand the difference. I, there are lots of issues, for example, uh, very controversial uh, issues uh, that uh, people uh, can be moral on, uh, on both sides of the issue, uh, uh, the death penalty, uh, uh, gay rights, uh, school busing, um, a whole host of racial quotas. Those are gut issues. And you can be moral on any side of those issues and respect the other person's position even if you disagree with them. So I respect the governor's position. I happen to have disagreed with it. As it relates uh, to uh, uh, President, uh, uh, candidate uh, President uh, Bush, <laughs> I don't, let me just tell you this, I, I doubt that he will ever be president if you want the God's honest truth. And I must uh, say that I believe he hurt himself with his comments in that area and on ethnics. I believe that in his own party, and they have said to me a number of people, leaders in his own party, who believe that he committed a terrible, terrible error for his own career. Okay? Next. Please. Hi. Um, I noticed that you admitted race from your description of young criminals. I've learned in criminal law and I've learned from experience living in New York that uh, most young criminals are blacks and Hispanics, member of, members of minority groups. Um, does that mean that we are inherently more violent, vicious, and irresponsible than white youth? Or is it possible, is it at all possible that bad economic and social conditions are somehow linked to crime? The uh, answer is uh, that uh, the uh, black community is only 12% of the country and there are huge areas huge areas where there are no blacks or very few blacks. Fine, I'm, I'm and in those areas where there are few blacks or no blacks, the same statistics would apply to the people who are almost all white. Okay. Okay? I, I, as I said, I mentioned economics, but um, in New York specifically, would you say that that applies to New York? I do not okay. believe uh, that uh, uh, race or economics is relevant to uh, criminality. Well, I, I don't believe that it is relevant. I, I, race is relevant necessarily, but fa the facts show, the statistics show, that most young criminals are blacks or Hispanics, and they also show that most uh, blacks and Hispanics live in poverty in this country. I, I, I want to again say to you uh, that uh, if you go to areas where they yes, are not black and Hispanic, you will find similar statistics amongst whites. Okay. I do, I'll give you the best statistic of all. In the height of the depression, in the 30s, much less crime than today where more people are affluent. More people were suffering in the 30s than are suffering today. I Take my word for it. I don't and there were fewer criminals. I think you failed to see my point though. Well, I've tried to, I've tried but I'm to simply make saying a couple that it is cases. not <laughs> poverty. Yes. Uh, well, it doesn't, I think it's linked in some ways, and I also think that you're failing to see yeah. what I'm telling you. The statistics show, okay. the, stati the statistics show that most criminals, the majority of young criminals, the majority of crime um, committed um, before the age of 19 yeah. are committed by blacks or Hispanics. And I'm going to say that most blacks, most Hispanics, most poor people are honest citizens. I would be and the first people to the who that. are ripped off most are blacks and Hispanics who are honest citizens okay. by other people. I disagree with you respectfully that either poverty or race or ethnicity is related to the criminality. I think poverty is, I think poverty is. Well, However, I'll be the first one to agree with you that most blacks and Hispanics and most poor people are hardworking and decent people. You bet. I'm one of them. You bet. Next. <laughs> What do you think is better about the New York of today than the New York of 30 years ago? Besides the mayor. <laughs> you saved me from an arrogant statement. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that every age, era, is the best the one that you are living in. I recall when I was first elected in the summer of 1978, I went to Coney Island to walk on the boardwalk. 
And an elderly lady, she must have been in her late 70s, came rushing as rush she could <laughs> towards me. And she grabbed my hand and she said, Mayor, Mayor, make it like it was. And I thought to myself at the time, it never was the way you think it was, <laughs> but I will try to make it better. These are the most exciting times with all of our problems. And therefore, I would never want to be back to the future in any movie or real life or spirited to the future ahead other than in a natural chronological way. That's the best answer I can give you. New York today is an exciting city, more exciting than it ever was. There is a renaissance and a resurgence and a feeling uh, that's different than 30 years ago, but the people who lived 30 years ago undoubtedly felt something similar. Sir. Uh, to get back to one of the earlier questions, I, I was wondering whether in light of your willingness to accept responsibility for the goings-on at the Parkings Violation Bureau, whether you're now prepared to support legislation which would prevent uh, political party leaders such as Mr. Manis or Stanley Friedman from participating in businesses that do business with yeah. the city, and also whether you're willing to support uh, legislation which would have put a cap on political contributions to uh, candidates for public office in New York. Yes. Do they have the New York Times up here? <laughs> it's in today's New York Times. No, I, the, I, I don't recall the Times article saying that you were going to support today. the suggestions of the Corporation yeah, Council. Yeah. The Corporation Council prepared that at my request. The caps on uh, political financing of $2,000 was taken from a speech that, or I should say an op-ed article uh, that I wrote uh, last November. A whole host of things that he is proposing, he and I have discussed together. I'm supporting every one of them, including the two you mentioned. It's set forth in detail in the New York Times today. Would you also support, beyond just the $2,000 cap, the barring of any contributions um, from, a business, from business people who, do, who have contracts with the city to people running for borough president or... It makes no sense because it's impossible to know who does business with the city and at what point you say they're not doing business with uh, the city. The city buys well over a billion dollars in goods and services in the course of a year. There are very few people who don't have some application with the city. Now you can say, well, it has to be at this level as opposed to this level, then it becomes a question. I don't believe that's the answer, frankly. I believe there are two safeguards. One is, pardon, one is that you limit the contribution so that unlike today, where as someone in a citywide race for mayor can make a contribution of up to $50,000 in any one election. We are proposing that it be capped at $2,000. Also, there already is required that whatever contribution you make be made public. I believe the publication and the limitation is adequate to deal with that particular problem. Okay, next, sir. Uh, a few questions, Mr. Mayor. Do you think that the turn of events in the Getz case is going to encourage uh, vigilantism? And what result would you have preferred to have seen in that? And also, could you tell us a few of your favorite Chinese restaurants in the city? Yes, I'll do that. Um, let's see. So first is uh, vigilantism. The second is uh, the, what I would have favored. And the third is uh, Chinese restaurants. OK. OK. Let me spell out for you what the Getz case had and currently has as its history, and then make some comments as what I believe its effect to be. A report is made that a person on a subway car shoots 
four young men and leaves the car and runs down a subway tunnel. It's reported in the press. My comment is asked for, and I say we will not tolerate vigilanteism in New York City. That is the way that sounded. The incident. The next day, I said, the person who committed this incident action should come back and tell us what happened because only he can tell us whether he was a victim or a villain. And he came back not because of me, but because they caught him up there. <laughs> And he was taken to a grand jury. And his taped confession made, I think, in Vermont was made public. And as he explained the incident, the grand jury apparently believed him and said that he was acting in self-defense and that they would not indict him for that matter, but would indict him for having possession of an illegal gun. The press came, the press often comes to ask me, uh, of me my opinion. <laughs> my opinion, that I thought what the grand jury did was appropriate, that I was pleased that they had indicted him for illegal possession of a gun, because it's my position that anyone who has an illegal gun should go to jail for a minimum of one year. If the governor wants to uh, uh, pardon, he can pardon. If the grand jury believes that there are uh, facts uh, which bear upon it that they don't want to indict, another story, but I don't believe there should be any ifs, ands, or buts. If you're in possession of an illegal gun and you're convicted, you should go to jail for a year. That's my belief, and that'll have a great deterrent in pe to people carrying uh, guns. Uh, illegally in uh, our city. Then the district attorney, Robert Morgenthau, said he had additional evidence of another witness not produced at the first grand jury. Happened to be one of the young men. The second grand jury indicted. The press asked me my opinion. I said they believed that there was sufficient evidence as a result of uh, uh, witness. I uh, have uh, no uh, alternative opinion. I don't have any adverse comment uh, on it. A year goes by, approximately, and several of the young men make statements bearing upon what they intended to do to get. What's that? Oh, she's right. She's one of the reporters who asked me my opinion. <laughs> and I thank you for that. Um, after he was exonerated by the grand jury, no bill uh, brought in on the, uh, first, uh, at the first grand jury, he then made a statement which was that the city of New York should arm 25,000 citizens. I was asked for my opinion. <laughs> I said, this guy is flaky. <laughs> Bob Morgenthau brought in the second grand jury because of a new witness. The second grand jury indicted for the shootings. And then over the course of the year, the case dragged out. There were some admissions. and. They, the defense counsel, brought a motion uh, before the court contesting the second grand jury's indictment. And the court agreed with the defense counsel and dismissed the indictment on the shooting with leave to appeal to a higher court or to apply to another judge for permission to go to a third grand jury. Now, that's chronologically uh, what happened. 
I have no opinion at this time as it relates to what the appeals court should do with the respect to the dismissal of the indictment or shooting. I don't know. That's, uh, Bob Morgenthau thinks that there's adequate uh, evidence. He's one of the great uh, law uh, enforcers, uh, uh, prosecutors. So I'm going to leave that uh, to uh, the court. I don't think asking... Uh, New York City, too, because about it. Uh, I, I have uh, two questions. The first one, this being a Rappaport lecture about urban affairs, um, the, the issue of the homeless um, seems to be appropriate, and uh, it, it seems like it's a problem that's major in New York and just growing, and um, it seems like the strategy to do anything about it is a pretty poor one. Um, so I wonder what the, uh, the strategy will be. Um, the second question is, who do you think uh, should be handling the <clears throat> case against the five families, uh, Morgenthau or uh, Giuliani? I know that they're, they're kind of fighting about it. Um, against the? The, the mafia. Uh, uh, the the, I, the I don't problem think, is that I don't think they're fighting about it. Uh, well, I, I haven't heard that they're fighting about organized crime. Uh, well, what, what, I, what I've heard is that the uh, that there that there has been bickering going on between the uh, district attorney's office and the U.S. attorney's office, and that's hurting the. Okay. Uh, well, I I think you got two cases confused. I don't think it relates to organized crime. I think it relates to the current investigation of PVP. I think that's what it is. But I'll, and that's the one I'll respond to because that's the one I think has been in the papers again. Uh, in the papers Hello. today. But let me uh, take your two questions. Uh, New York City uh, doesn't have uh, the largest number of homeless at all, even with its uh, size. I don't believe we do. I do believe we provide for the largest number, but other cities don't provide. Very few cities have municipal facilities that provide temporary shelter for those who need it. And I'll tell you what the city of New York is doing. City of New York, probably last night, although I didn't call in to get the exact number, probably last night, 9,000 men and women, 15% of them women, were given temporary shelter in a dormitory with beds on a gym floor in some arsenal or some other large facility. We provide those people with three meals a day a bed with a blanket, sheets, three meals, I said to you, a, a medical care, a sanitation facility, shower, and a recreation room, and they never have to leave the building. And I'm told that in many of these facilities, one-third of the population never leaves the building. We don't require that they do. Now, nobody's ever turned away. And there are complaints uh, by uh, the advocates that uh, we don't provide enough space, uh, that it is uh, dangerous. Frankly, uh, it's uh, far less dangerous than the streets, and I don't believe uh, dangerous uh, to any greater degree uh, than uh, any other comparable facility. Uh, a uh, hotel uh, that uh, used to be on the Bowery uh, that we used to call flop houses. Uh, I don't think it's any more dangerous than they uh, were, and I don't think that they were particularly dangerous. Occasionally, you're going to get a uh, criminal uh, committing a crime or a demented person committing a crime, but that happens to the whole city uh, as a result of there being criminals and demented people. You know that, and I know that, as well as other cities outside of uh, New York. Now, with families, we provide shelter in 55 hotels and five congregate shelters for about 4,000 families or roughly 16,000 people every night. And I suppose uh, many of you must have seen uh, the show uh, 60 Minutes, and uh, it's probably what uh, triggers your uh, question. Anybody else see that show? Good. Let me then just make a brief comment about it. You heard, but nobody listened, to uh, Ed Bradley say, uh, the federal government does not allow uh, localities to use the money that they provide for temporary shelter for permanent shelter. Remember hearing that? 
You don't remember hearing that. But it was there. I heard it. But uh, I'm one of the few people who understood it. Because it means that you can't take the money for permanent shelter. And um, you heard him say, we're paying a lot of money for hotel space. And we don't like paying for it. But we uh, are lucky when hotels rent to us. We think we're lucky. Even though they make a lot of money, they also have a lot of damage. And not every hotel will rent to us. But the average rental is $15 a night per person. Now, we're in a room, that's $60 a night for the room, on the average. Do you know many hotels, four in a room, where you could go for $15 in any city? I don't know of any. If you multiply that $60 by seven days, it's $420. And if you multiply that by four weeks, it's over $1,600. And that is how you get to these huge, obscene rentals. We have no alternative, although we try. So in the last two and a half years, for example, we built 6,000 permanent apartments, specially and only for those who are in these circumstances. And we started two and a half years ago with 2,200 families. We took 6,000 families out of that setting, put them into permanent apartments, and I told you last night we had over 4,000 families. It is a very difficult matter for us, and it will not be addressed in a way where people can look forward to permanent housing in a reasonable uh, time frame until the federal government gets back into the business of building low-income housing. It's as simple as that. Now, in that program, you may remember that suddenly on the screen flashed this young, handsome congressman. You don't remember me? <laughs> uh, Fifteen years ago. Remember? Everybody remember? I looked terrific. <laughs> And there I was, denouncing the mayor for doing what I was doing. And said Mr. Bradley, although he didn't tell me he was going to use uh, that, he didn't uh, at the time, but there's nothing wrong with that, that's okay. He said, uh, <laughs> he said to me, didn't you uh, denounce uh, Mayor Lindsay? And I said, sure. I didn't know what I was talking about 15 years ago. And what I said 15 years ago about what the mayor could do was factually incorrect. And that if I had the power, said I, I would sentence every congressman to be a mayor for one year as punishment. <laughs> now, wait, can I just... Rather than have you answer the question about a case that you know I don't really know anything about, okay. and, and assuring you that I am not uh, mixing up the two cases, but have heard from at least somebody who... Okay, but I, I'm not aware of it, so I can't comment uh, that they are uh, scrapping about it. Okay? I can't. Sir? I'd just like to know, um, as the Democratic mayor of New York, what you're doing to find a Democratic opponent for Republican Senator D'Amato, or are you going to... Not my DeMato obligation uh, to uh, find an opponent. Well, I mean, are you interested in organizing Democrats in the state so that Democrats can take back the Senate in... I'll, I'll be uh, right up front with you. Uh, I'm uh, certainly uh, going to um, hope to support a uh, Democratic uh, candidate. Uh, I'm not out there looking uh, for one. I'll tell you very uh, directly why. If you're a mayor and you have to deal with other governmental units on which the city's lifeline depends. And Washington is one such lifeline. And if you have two senators, one who is a Democrat, an excellent uh, senator, Pat uh, Moynihan, and one who is a uh, Republican and who, in my uh, judgment, is an excellent uh, senator. You may disagree, but I uh, am uh, an analyzing excellence on the basis of helping the city. That's what excellence uh, relates to, to me. You can argue uh, uh, with uh, me uh, as to his foreign policy, uh, you know, the, the UN, uh, you know, it's the old story um, uh, you, uh, of the, uh, of the um, 
people who are dis describing who shall take care of the important things, and one of them says, well, I'll take care of the bank account, you take care of the UN. Now, <laughs> I have to take care of the bank account in the sense of getting help from Washington. Al D'Amato has been very helpful. And if you think that I'm going to go out there and attack them, and then find that when the city needs help, he'll say, well, listen, Ed. <laughs> well, I'm not going to hurt the city in pursuit of a political point. Doesn't mean I'm necessarily going to support him. He didn't support me for mayor. <laughs> but it does mean I don't perceive it as my obligation to go out and look for his opponent. Am I clear? Pretty but, clear, yeah. Okay, next. Okay, one more question. Sir. Mr. Mayor, uh, a few weeks ago I saw on TV a tape of a, um, I think it was an Arkansas judge senten sentencing a 15-year-old uh, boy to death for first-degree murder. Mm -hmm. Now, if you were the uh, judge and you could do anything that you could, what would you do? Mm -hmm. And getting back to uh, your lecture today, mm -hmm. um, are you proposing a bright line rule as to an age, or are you saying that the jury should be able to uh, take into uh, account a number of factors? In other words, do you uh, just want to lower it? To a uh, jury should always be able, uh, or a judge, or a judge and uh, jury, all of the aspects of a case to determine punishment. There should never be, uh, uh, in those states uh, where you have death penalty, a mandatory death penalty, in fact, that it would be unconstitutional. There are uh, some uh, cases uh, where uh, you have career criminals, and uh, if you uh, have been convicted on prior occasions, if you're found guilty on the third occasion, then, or even on the second occasion, then there are mandatory minimums uh, that uh, judges uh, must uh, provide in the event of uh, conviction. And as it relates to juveniles who commit felonies, I believe that they should be subject to felony punishment. I believe that. Now, uh, and remember, we're not talking about juvenile delinquency. We're not talking about offenses. We're talking about rape. We're talking about physical assault. I believe that to simply say that is a juvenile offense and not a crime makes no sense if you want to protect a society. That's what I, and you always can take into consideration the age, and the age which I stated in my speech that this would begin would be the age of 13, where you would be held responsible. The nature of the responsibility, that's for the judge and the jury. They will decide. Maybe they will uh, simply uh, decide uh, that an alternative uh, uh, sentence uh, other than jail is uh, required. But they ought to have the right, the right, which is always reviewable by an appellate court. It's not going to be indiscriminately used. I am simply talking about those who are 15, and I gave you the case of a guy who said he's going to go out and commit crimes because he knows he cannot be punished until he's 16. I gave you that reference. That uh, particular person should be punished and punished as a felon. Okay, now you asked about the death penalty. I don't believe that anyone should be put to death who is... Uh, who has not reached uh, his uh, majority. Majority in uh, this uh, country is usually 18 uh, years of age. His majority or her majority. I don't, however, take the position that if you committed a crime before uh, you reached uh, your uh, majority and uh, you are uh, apprehended and sentenced and uh, you are now uh, uh, an adult, defined as having reached your majority, uh, that you shouldn't be subject uh, to the severest uh, punishment because uh, you did it when you were uh, 16 instead of uh, uh, 18. You follow what I've just said? And I believe that in most of those cases, I don't know your particular case, but what I believe the cases are is that an individual 
who committed a crime when they were under 18, now that they're 18 and having been convicted for that earlier crime, subject to the death penalty, ask that it not be executed because they committed the crime when they were under 18. I don't agree with that contention. Am I clear? Good. Now, let me, I, well, can I take this one more? But you're the Thank last you. one. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Two quick questions. Sure. One, in response to an earlier question, you said you couldn't understand the attacks you received by members of the press right. or comments you made regarding Mr. Manners. Could it be because a week earlier you called Mr. Manners or Donnie, I believe, your best friend and that even if he was with yeah. a prostitute, it right. wouldn't matter? Correct. Yeah, that's that exactly you... what I said, and I don't think that has a bearing on it. I'll tell you why. Let me explain to you why. Donald Manis is someone who, with whom I've been friends for more than 20 years. The night that he was found in his car, they called me at 3 o'clock in the morning, and they told me that he was found in his car with his uh, wrist slit and uh, dying. And I rushed to the hospital, and they said he had lost a third of his blood, and uh, it turned out that he lost actually half of his blood, and that he would need a blood transfusion. I said, I'm available. Uh, they had enough blood, and so they didn't take uh, any volunteers. I then saw him subsequently, but before I saw him, obviously there was a lot of uh, discussion. And the area that he was found in is an area uh, where uh, prostitutes uh, abound. And so the newspapers, not me, the newspapers said, uh, <laughs> maybe a hustler. Okay. At least that's my recollection, newspapers. If it wasn't the news, I see you shaking your head, one of the newspaper reporters. So it was uh, discussed uh, by uh, cops and others, and it was in the public domain. I said, I said that whether it was a prostitute, a hustler, or there was another rumor that he had sought to commit suicide because his father had committed uh, suicide and there was a suicide history in the family. I said, whether it was a hustler or whether he committed an attempt of suicide, so long as it didn't involve, I said this publicly, corruption, which the public will never forgive, but either of these other two matters, who cares? We'll forgive him because he had told a story that he had been kidnapped by two guys who had uh, slugged him and uh, cut his uh, wrist, and nobody believed uh, that uh, story. And so then I went, after uh, he uh, admitted that he had lied, and he said, I attempted suicide for personal reasons. Then I said, that's the toughest thing he had to do. From now on, it's okay so long as it didn't involve corruption. And I went to see him. And indeed, uh, I hugged him and I told him, you don't have to worry anymore and the worst is over. And then two days later, I think it's two days later, there is uh, the uh, Daily News and an article by Jimmy Breslin that an attorney has said he paid him $36,000 Donnie Manis, yes. and uh, to get contracts, and that Donnie Manis had committed uh, these uh, corrupt acts. There wasn't any, qu and that this attorney was given immunity, ultimately, by uh, the uh, U.S. attorney. And Donnie Manis didn't deny at any time this story. I believed it was perfectly appropriate for me to call for his immediate resignation, which I did, and to voice my anger, as I did by calling him what I did for the reason that he has harmed the body politic. You have to understand that. 42% of the people in the city of New York believe that most people in uh, public office are corrupt. That's what that poll showed. Thank God, uh, 78 or, or more uh, said uh, that they uh, believe that I'm an honest man. Now, what I'm saying to you is, you have no idea of the impact of what he did on other politicians. 
And that is why I voiced my comment, which from a, you know, you ought to give it to a law school here at Harvard as to whether or not outside of a courtroom you're allowed to say these things. I think you are. I'm a lawyer. I'm happy uh, to uh, uh, en engage in that debate. Okay. Uh, second question, sir. Uh, you said you didn't believe Mr. Bush would ever be elected president. No. Who on the Republican side of the aisle do you think could possibly get the number? Well, uh, who are two like good that? people, even though I wouldn't be voting for them because Correct. I will be voting for the Democratic uh, candidate? Correct. Yes. Thank okay. you. Okay. I believe there are two good people in the uh, Republican uh, Party. <laughs> One is uh, Senator Bob Dole, and the other, other is Governor Tom King. Bob Dole. Uh, Democrats, I believe uh, that you have uh, many more good people than in the uh, Republican Party. <laughs> that you uh, have uh, Mario Cuomo. Uh, Sam, Senator Sam, um, uh, Nunn, <laughs> Senator Sam Nunn uh, from uh, Georgia. He's a, uh, an extraordinary uh, person, even if I found it difficult to pronounce his name. Uh, Gary Hart. Uh, Bill Bradley and uh, Richard uh, Gephardt would be the maybe the fourth or fifth person whose names uh, come readily to mind. Uh, they're all uh, first rate. I think we have to go. Uh, I happen to uh, no no I, I uh, know uh, the uh, governor and uh, I like him very much. I don't know what his plans are, and he's certainly a very able uh, man. And if he were a, a contender, he would fit uh, very nicely into that group. Okay, thank you all. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Please remember to fill out your surveys at the door. Thank you very much.